Interview with Mr. Robert Stanley Shelter. Shetler. Shetler. Oh, excuse me. S-H-E-T-L-E-R. Shetler, yeah. Right? Well, Everybody mistake, makes the mistake on that. The bank does it, too. <laughs> on 30 March 2001, Syracuse Armory interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hanselm. Videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Shetler, tell me about where you were born and when. Well, I was born January 20th, 1924 in Syracuse, New York at the old Good Shepherd Hospital. Uh, Did you grow up in Syracuse? Yes, I, I was, was in Syracuse all my life up till <coughs> I was away in, in the service in World War II. Uh, graduated from high school here in January of 1942 uh, and uh, a week later I was 18 years old and a, and a month later I enlisted in the service. Uh, but if you really want to go back to December 7th, I think we should. I worked at a drugstore. I was what they called a soda jerk. It was a soda fountain. Every, every drugstore had a soda fountain back in those days. And four or five stools at the counter. And, and uh, December 7th was not my normal day to work with my employer. Generally, I worked with another druggist. But they had switched jobs that day. And we used to open 9 to 12 and then close till 5 o'clock. We closed at noon and I went home to eat and we heard the news about Pearl Harbor at that time. So when I called my boss to wake him up at about 4.30 to open at 5, I told him, well, you know, we're at war. Well, he didn't believe me and nobody else did, but, but that's all the talk of the conversation was that night. People come into the drugstore. In fact, I had a few so-called friends who volunteered to go down and enlist me the next morning. I told them, no, I could do it myself. But uh, that's where it started. So I got out of high school then in, in January, and the following month to decide what to do. We, we knew eventually, all of me and my friends, that we would probably be going in the service. Uh, I tried to talk my parents into signing for me to go in the Marines, but they refused. They finally compromised, and they signed for me to go in the Navy. And uh, it was quite a shock to them, though later on, I'm going to skip a few years, when when uh, I was in the Navy Hospital Corps, but then I was transferred from the Mar Navy to the Marines. I wore a Marine uniform and greens and khakis, or Navy blues and whites, too. And they couldn't understand, nobody, nowadays nobody else can understand exactly what it is, but, but some of the Marines deny it, but they are part of the Navy. Mm -hmm. Marine Corps, it's Navy Hospital Corps, Navy Nurses Corps, Navy Chaplains Corps, all different corps. And we were transferred just like going from one ship to another, from the Navy to the Marines. But uh, I enlisted and my folks finally signed for me to go in the Navy. Went from Syracuse to Albany, New York, where I had final physical, and then they sent me back to Syracuse waiting for an opening at Newport, Rhode Island, where the recruit training was located. And then they called me in a several weeks later to go back to Albany. I got back there, but Newport was was filled. So they sent me right back to Syracuse to Great Lakes where I went through boot camp and uh, after boot camp I was lucky I did get about 10 days leave. Some of the fellows in my boot camp company went right to sea. but I, I And then I went back to Great Lakes where I went to a hospital course school where they gave us uh, training on first, a, uh, first uh, uh, aid and uh, things of that nature, also spe specifically what can happen to you if you're in like in, in, a, in an army group or a marine group, uh, wounds you would have to take care of and things of that nature. And after course school when I graduated, I was, then went to Charleston, South Carolina to the Navy Yard Hospital down there where I served duty in the laboratory. And I was there all the summer of 1942. And then, at that time, I, I know afterwards now what was happening. They were preparing for the invasion of North Africa. And quite a few of us corpsmen were transferred from there to, to uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and were assigned to ships. Well, I was one of the lucky ones. I didn't go to North Africa, but I went to Portland, Maine, where I uh, went aboard the USS Relief. 
I think it was the USS Relief was the original Navy hospital ship. At that time in Portland, Maine, it had just come down from Argentia, Newfoundland, and it was painted a battleship gray camouflage. We went from Portland to Boston, the Navy Yard, where all this gray paint was chipped off of it. It was painted white with a green stripe around it, big red crosses on the side, and then uh, floodlights were hung over the side. After all this work was done, we went from there through the Panama Canal to the South Pacific, the Southwest Pacific, specifically in the area of Esperito Santos and New Caledonia, uh, where we took in casualties and, and it, as a floating hospital, really what it was. Quite a few fellows that were for, uh, on some of the islands there had malaria or dengue fever and things of this nature, but besides uh, war wounds. And after my turn down there, I came back to the States where I was transferred to the Fleet Marine Force. Now, as I said before, previously, I think, the Fleet Marine Force is a part of the Navy. Uh, at that time, I went through what they call field med school. And this was more specifically serving with troops in the field. Uh, what things we had to do uh, with these troops, uh, not only in combat, but also in rear echelon areas. Uh, setting up uh, mess halls, uh, toilet facilities, uh, physical exams, uh, all of this nature. Well, after going through this field med school, then I was transferred from Camp Pendleton in California to the 4th Marine Division in Hawaii. Now, uh, while there with the 4th Marine Division, we went through some further training uh, they were re regrouping, coming back from uh, tour of duty at Saipan and Tinian and so forth. And uh, uh, there was quite a few other of us Navy corpsmen that joined me up at that time. Uh, then on, I think the date was exactly, if I'm quite sure about it, was December 31st, New Year's Eve almost. Uh, we went aboard ship in the... Uh, uh, the island there where we were located in Maui, and preparing for, we didn't know then at the time, but preparing for the invasion of Iwo Jima. Uh, we were on board ship for a month and a half until the middle of February. And the date, depending upon where you were at the time, they tell me the 17th and the 18th, depending upon which side of the uh, line you were on, you know, for that. And uh, we, my, my outfit, the 23rd Marines, we were a reserve, not a reserve outfit, we were second, uh, uh, well I'm trying to think the exact word, but uh, we were in part of the invasion, but we weren't the first line, uh, we were with the second group. I was with a, a, a battalion aid station, and uh, luckily for me I was only there a couple of days when I got my Purple Heart. <laughs> Uh, I, what some of the fellows went through, I'm glad I didn't have to go through it. But uh, I was evacuated after being wounded. And I went aboard a hospital ship that took us to Guam, uh, where we were supposed to pick up transportation from Guam to Pearl Harbor. When we got there, though, we found out that Pearl Harbor, the hospital, was filled up. They put us on a, uh, a, a transport ship and took us back to the States. Of course, then we didn't do any crying when we found out we had to go back to the States, went back to San Francisco. And then from San Francisco, we were transferred to various hospitals in the state. I was transferred to the Camp Lejeune Marine Base where I went through several operations and also had a chance to go home on leave from the hospital. Uh, after that time, when I was discharged from the hospital, I was transferred to Norfolk, Virginia again where I served duty for several months at the fleet service school, which was as good a duty to get because there, at that fleet service school there was baker school, things of that nature. They practiced on you on doing their baking, you know, it was very good. Uh, and then that was where I was discharged in 1945, December of 1945. When I got out of the service, I stayed in the uh, uh, inactive reserves for, uh, for a while, then transferred to the active reserves. 
when I was transferred to the active reserve, I was transferred to the what they called the 10th Tank Battalion at the old Syracuse Airport. Uh, there was about 10 of us Navy hospital corpsmen there and around 500 uh, Marine Reserves. Uh, I picked the wrong time to transfer to the active reserves because August of 1950 we were all activated. I think it was the 20th of August we had a, a, a reserve drill on a Sunday. That's when he handed us our orders to report back the next morning for active duty. And we were on active duty at the old Syracuse airport, I believe it was the 4th of September. We left Syracuse, two train loads, to the west coast. And uh, I got to the west coast at that time, by the way, I, my, my, my wife and we had a boy, just a year old. Uh, I was informed that they were going to keep me there at Camp Pendleton as an instructor in the field medical school they had there, which sounded good. So I sent for my wife and my youngest son, or my oldest son, and they uh, came to California. The bad news, though, was that when they were on the plane, I heard that I was leaving the States, going to Korea. In fact, they were in California for two weeks and two days when I went aboard ship in San Diego and went to Japan. Uh, it was quite a hectic trip over the, through the North Pacific because it was a rough that, at that time. But we got to Japan and went through some further training there. In fact, some of the Marines that were with us went out on the rifle range the first time they'd ever shot a rifle. Here are these are reserves that were called back in and I was helping them learn how to fire, fire a rifle, you know, because I had done it. Uh, during camp, and when I was at Camp Pendleton during the previous uh, World War II. Uh, finally, on November the 4th, I know the date, we went aboard ship to go to Japan. Well, I got a kick out of it because the gunny sergeant in charge of us, I said to him, I says, Gunny, I'll see you. I'm going home. He said, What are you talking about? I said, November the 4th, my enlistment is up. Goodbye. Crazy as I got news for you. Of course, that was that time the president had extended us all year, and I knew it too. But uh, I, I thought I got to, I got to kid this guy a little bit, you know. But I didn't go home. I went aboard ship, and then we, we went to Wonsan, in Korea, and the corpsmen. There was, I say, about 40 of us Navy corpsmen. They issued us all, I think it was 20 rounds of ammunition for our carbines. They put us on a train of supplies going up to Ham Hung, Hung Nam area. Uh, we were supposed to be guards. I don't know how many of us knew how to really fire a weapon, but uh, they, at that time they were having trouble with guerrillas who were raiding some of these trains, but they saw so many troops. And they didn't know how good we were, but how many troops were on board this train, they didn't bother us. And then uh, we joined the, the corpsman, Navy corpsman, we joined the uh, uh, a battalion, uh, the medical battalion at Ham Hung, and then they split us up in different groups. Well, I was assigned to the 5th Marines. Now that's another auspicious day was November the 10th. And every place I went, the 1st Division, the, the uh, Marines, 5th uh, Marines, the 2nd Battalion, the company, all had Marine birthday cake. And they wanted no doc, you want a piece of cake? Well, I won't repeat here what I <laughs> told them they could do with their cake, but because uh, I had to kid these Marines a little bit, you know. But uh, I joined the first platoon of Easy Company, Second Bat Fifth Marines. They call it Echo Company now, but it was, at those days it was Easy Company. And we went up from there. And we had got went up to the uh, Kodori Hagaruri area, and Thanksgiving Day. My outfit was on a, a hill just outside of uh, the Chosen Reservoir, outside of Hagaruri. And the following Monday, the, the date was November the 27th, they pulled us down off the hill and there was an Army outfit that relieved us, and I, I should know it, but I can't tell you which one it was. We passed through the 7th Marines, and at that time I saw a fellow from Maddydale, just right outside here, who was with one of the Navy corpsmen with the 7th Marines. He was alongside the road. Dick Hall, and Dick Hall is deceased, by the way, now. That was the last time I saw Dick when we passed him through the, the 7th Marines. 
and my platoon and my company went to a place just outside of Udamne was the name. I always like to say that name. It, it, I tell students in school, I says, I'm not swearing. This is the name of the city. Y-U-D-A-M-N-I. And uh, we set up a place they called Easy Alley, Easy Gunning, uh, a permanent defense. Now, when we were doing this, late in the afternoon, we had what they call friendly fire come in. Our weapons company was zeroing in their mortars, and they dropped a WP white phosphorus almost in the middle of our uh, area. Nobody got hit, luckily. And of course, they were told to adjust their weapons a little bit, which they did. And then we set up. Uh, also, long in the afternoon, our lieutenant, he yelled, I'm hit, and he's laying on the ground. Well, the captain yelled over, you are not. So they had a little rivalry going on. Who was going to get out of Korea first, you know? They were there, then there with the brigade when they landed at Incheon. And the yelled, yeah, no, I'm not. Well, the other corpsman, there was another corpsman. Well, yes, he was hit. A sniper had caught him in the leg. And we, they evacuated him out at that time. And our platoon sergeant took over then. Uh, the platoon sergeant's name was Bogomanario, and he had a big red beard. Just like that. And the, by the way, the gunny sergeant had a big black beard. Both of these fellows were from the 1st Marine Division. They'd been in Guadalcanal. And I'll tell you, that night was when the Chinese hit us. I was glad these old timers were with us. These fellows knew what they were doing. I can remember the gunny sergeant trooping the line at night at dark. You didn't know who was where. I, when, when he came up near me, he'd say, Who's that? And I'd tell him, It's Doc. Okay, Doc. I, and uh, but that night, uh, the other Navy corpsman was wounded. We had one Marine that was killed that night. In fact, he got the Silver Star for what he did that night. Uh, the uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. Oh, the uh, yeah, okay, we're <laughs> getting my memory sometimes, but uh, the biggest problem we had, we I had to say we had that one one kill. The, the lieutenant was wounded, and also the other corpsman. The next morning, about half of our platoon was was gone. They couldn't walk. Frostbite. It went down to between 30 and 50 below zero that night. And uh, the issue we had, uh, what they called shoe packs, they were like an overshoe, and they had a felt liner in the in the bottom of them. And I had two pair of socks on besides these, your feet would sweat so much. You'd take them off to change your socks, and the socks would come off inside the boots, frozen inside. That's how cold it got. Uh, I think I've heard that they since that time they changed it. I don't know. I can't tell you. But I know I was after the men all the time. I said, I, I carried extra socks inside my shirt right now. In fact, you might be interested. I had a pair of uh, summer underwear on, a pair of long johns, winter underwear, uh, a pair of marine green trousers, marine utilities, uh, a, a parka with a hood on it, and a helmet, and a pair of gloves. And it's funny because I went to a reunion last a year, a year ago in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, and one of the fellows at the reunion said to me, hey doc, you tagged me over in Korea. And I, I said, what's he talking about? I didn't remember taking anybody over there. I don't think I really tagged them because it, it was so cold you couldn't write. How are you going to, you know? I think I know I've looked at fellows, I took care of them. I remember taking my gloves off, putting them on, taking them off, putting them on. You couldn't put bandages on anybody or dressing on with a glove on. And also I remember one time taking care of somebody and there's one this Marine had a pair of pearl handle matched 45s. And, and I don't know what was wrong with him, but I remember putting him on a truck. He could, and he handed me these pearl handle forty fives. Here, Doc, you might need these. I don't anymore. Well, after that time, the, I, I lost those forty fives. But it was when we hit a roadblock along the way. I was taking care of somebody, and I heard they call first platoon out to go to take care of that roadblock. And uh, when I got up to where the roadblock was, the platoon was halfway up the hill. And I heard one, a fellow, I think it was a company runner, 
He says, wait a minute, Doc, I'll go with you. And I just threw everything off except my first aid kit and my rifle. He went up the hill with me. Well, halfway up, we hit a, a roadblock, or a block house, I guess it was. And just getting close to it, there was a Chinaman come out. And this Marine that was going to be shot him. I, I didn't even realize I'd see the fellow. He saw him. But uh, that was the, my experience going along. As I say, we brought, well, go back to you, damn me. When I, uh, the morning of the 28th of November would be after the Chinese hit us, they cut us all down in formation. They uh, told us what we were going to do. First platoon, my platoon, went up on a hill, and we were covered for all the rest of the division. And we put all the dead and the wounded on different trucks, and we stayed up there till all the rest of the division, the fifth, the fifth Marines, had pulled out. And then they called us down off that hill. Uh, and we brought up rear guard from there, going into uh, Hagaruri. I can remember going into Hagaruri. No, also before that, you know, this frostbite was affecting everybody. And an awful lot of us could hardly walk if the heat was so bad. And I can remember probably every man in the outfit one time or another said, Doc, can I have a ride? And my answer was, when you see me get on a truck or get in a jeep, then you can get in, period. And, uh, but we got to Hagaruri, and there was a perimeter defense set up, and we went through this defense perimeter. And right in, just inside, was a, a, a mess hall set up where they were serving a hot chow. And these fellows standing in line, I can remember hearing them shake their mess gear. And they said, <coughs> here comes the rear guard. Well, our lieutenant, who we had after, at that time then, he said, Doc, do you remember that? I talked to him a few months ago on the telephone. I said, yeah, I remember that. I says, every one of these guys that couldn't walk, they walked in step, in formation. Of course, I told him, I said, they were out of step. I was the only one in step. I, kidding the lieutenant, you know, and he chuckled on that a little bit. But uh, here this... Uh, we had, uh, we were told also we could get, go through the mess hall, get some hot chow. Probably it was powdered eggs, I don't even remember now, I'm quite sure it was. Uh, powdered eggs and probably some uh, uh, corned beef hash or something like that. But it was hot chow and we'd been on rations for I don't know how many days before that. But we had strict orders that uh, one time through the mess line, and only one time through, see, well, one time Joe didn't fill me up, so I turned around and got back in line again. Who's standing alongside of me but the lieutenant? <laughs> but uh, I throw that in for a little little joke like that. And uh, then we were set up there at Hagaru for a couple of nights there, perimeter defense. And, you know, it's a, I can't remember time. There's one thing right after another. Just like these fellows that say, well, I took care of them or did so. I don't remember that. But I, I know it was cold. I know when I had a chance to where we stopped somewhere, sat down, I changed my socks, had extra socks inside my uh, shirt. Uh, it's where I carried a can of beans. And that's something else, by the way. Did you ever eat a can of beans, open up the little seagrass and can of beans? You know how you eat it? You take a bayonet and you pull one bean out at a time because they're frozen solid. Uh, some of the fruit, cans of fruits we had over there, they would thaw out inside your shirt. Uh, if you ever took a can of beans though and put it in a fire, if you had a chance to, be sure and poke a hole in the top of the can, otherwise the can will explode. <laughs> and, you know, when you hear a can of beans explode, everybody figures it's a hand grenade and everybody hits the deck. But uh, this is things that I can remember that happened along the way. Uh, eventually, I remember coming down the pass, going across the bridge that they had to rebuild. Got down to the foot of the pass, and there was uh, trains waiting for us. They put us on trains and took us to the seaport, went aboard. And this is something that, you know, so many times we hear about what happened to civilians over in Korea. This uh, no gun re incident, where supposedly some of them were killed, or many of them, I don't know how many. But when we were evacuated from Hem Hung, on board the same ships, there was 100,000 
Korean civilians that went with us out of North Korea. And this isn't played up an awful lot, but I can remember seeing them on some of the ships, you know. They went to, down to Busan and Masan, Southern Korea with us. Um, other than that, the ship was crowded. Uh, you had two meals a day on the ship going down there. Uh, you got in in the morning, got in line. After you ate, you come out, and the thing to do is get right back in line again because you had that long to wait before you ate supper at night. <laughs> but uh, that was that. We went to, down near Masan. We, we did regroup. Uh, replacements come in. And then after that, uh, we went north, uh, different areas. And I was there during the first Chinese Spring Offensive. I came back home in May of 1951. I didn't know it at the time, but my mother was quite sick. And I had a brother-in-law whose boss, well, he were, had a lot to say with the Red Cross, and they pulled some strings and they got me back. That's how I came back to the States. My orders read to come home to report back to Treasure Island for further transfer back to the 1st Marine Division. Mm -hmm. But when I got back there, because I had my time in overseas, they kept me there for a couple of months and transferred me back to Brooklyn where I finally got discharged from the service. That's my time in Korea. And yeah, World War II both. Mm -hmm. Now after you got out of the service, mm -hmm. did you go back into the reserves? I stayed, after I got out, I stayed in the inactive reserves. I, I, in fact, I was one of the first ones in Syracuse. There were several, as our picture was in the paper when we enlisted. What about after Korea? This. After Korea, no, I didn't stay in the reserve. I thought seriously about staying because of the time I had in, but I didn't tell my wife that. She'd have killed me. I'm quite sure she would have. Uh, I took a test for second class Navy corpsman over in Korea. I passed the test. I didn't get it. I think that they figured there's no sense in sending those rates up to the front line because I'm not going to use them very long anyway. That second class petty officer in the Navy was the same thing as staff NCO of the Marines, which means an awful lot, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but I, I, I didn't get it. No, I, I didn't stay in the reserves after that. I had close to 10 years of active duty and reserve time then. Uh, well, when you got back from World War II, mm -hmm. what did you do in civilian life? I, I worked, I'm trying to think now. I had a friend of mine who ran a grocery store and he had just bought it out from his partner and he asked me if I'd come to work for him. That's what I did, I went to work for him. And then uh, after that I did work for uh, H.J. Heinz Company, Keyboard Biscuit Company in, in the grocery wholesale business, grocery business. I did that. Uh, of course, then I, about that same time I got married. And we were married for two years when my oldest son was born. And say so he was just a year old when I was called back in 1950. Yeah, he was born in 1949. By the way, you might be interested, a little, a little humorous too. They came out to California. And Jim, at the time, a year old, he had real tight curly hair. And he was crawling up and down. My wife told me he was crawling up and down the aisle of the airplane. And who was on the airplane but Bob Hope? And Bob Hope picked up Jim. And he wanted to know whose little girl this was. Well, Jim had a haircut the next morning in hell in Los Angeles. <laughs> but uh, I met them at the airport, took them down to a motel I had reserved for them. I had to go right back to the base. I told my wife there's a grocery store up at the corner and there's a couple other ladies that are living here that you will get to meet whose husbands are, are with the outfit that from Syracuse. And I uh, had to leave her. That was it, you know, I'll go back. And uh, then of course I say she was out there too. And I knew what I didn't tell her at the time, but I knew I was going overseas at that time. Two weeks and two days. What uh, civilian employment did you take up when you got back from Korea? Well, I was at J. Heinz Company. I went back with them. They had saved the job for me. 
It was on the road for them doing service work and selling. And did you have any other children? Yes, I have a daughter who I live with now. See, I started falling down about seven years ago. And the government finally agreed it's the post cold weather trauma it's happening. I am on a pension from the government, 20% on each leg. I also get 10% for the wound in my ear from World War II. Uh, yes, I, and then I have a son, a younger son, who lives in Alexandria, Virginia, who I'm planning on visiting this next week when I go to North Carolina. Uh, go back and take a look at a couple of uh, couple of things we talked about. Mm -hmm. What were, what was life like? I'm going to go back to World War II first. It's your life aboard the USS Relief. What was that like? Well, to start at the beginning, it was just like on board any other ship, I would say. But when we got to the South Pacific, which is really what we went, what was on that farm. Uh, the Navy has a term what they call port and starboard. On duty, if it reports on duty, starboard's off duty, half and half, the crew. And I can remember in New Caledonia, as we was, where we'd go out and uh, play baseball, maybe get a can or two of beer at the same time. Uh, on board ship, on the, the ship, let's see. Part of the time I was at work in the ear, eye, ear, nose, and throat clinic and did help out with some operations like uh, tonsils and adenoids and things of that nature. I can remember helping out with an appendectomy at one time, though. Uh, after that, I served Ward A, which is a communicable disease ward. And this is something, by the way, Going across the Pacific, we had an outbreak of mumps and measles on board ship. Of course, mumps can be a serious problem if you're 18, 19, 25 years of age. And uh, I think that at one time we the, we had the ward was full of fellows with mumps, and then we had we had the measles epidemic too. Where it come from, we don't know, but it just hit us. Probably it's something they picked up in Panama on <laughs> Liberty there. So this was a pretty big ship. I mean, oh yes, this was a big ship. Operating theaters, wards, clinics, right? right. Big mess hall, uh, uh, and and the compartments we had. By the way, we had about a dozen nurses on board, besides medical doctors. Uh, the medical doctor in charge of us, a Navy commander. It's interesting about him. I can remember. He had perpetual seasickness, but he refused to take shore duty. And I can remember several other fellows. We we pulled the anchor up in Portland, Maine. Right away, they got seasick. <laughs> Thankfully, I didn't go through that. But I, I know one fellow from from Kansas. He was he was so glad. I guess when he got back to the states or got ashore. Uh, Trying to think of anything else on board ship that you'd be interested in, but it was it was a complete hospital. Well, where did you birth? Well, I was at the water line, way forward. In fact, the portholes where we were, you could open up, you could look out and see the see the water there. And if it was a rough rough weather, you wouldn't leave them open. Uh, if it was calm, it was a different story. Uh, also, by the way, crossing. The Pacific. I remember we we crossed the equator, plus the meridian, and uh, they did have services on board ship where we were inducted into the uh, Royal Order, the Domain of the Deep, or whatever they wanted to call it at that time. You know, and coming there when I came back to the states. By the way, I the ship stayed out there. I came back on one of these small Navy aircraft carriers. And the fellows on board there hadn't uh, been indoctrinated, and I helped uh, do that. 
we made up some awful sick medicines in the sick bay that time. You name it, we got it mixed together for them. <laughs> And you said that you were only on uh, Iwo Jima for several days before you were wounded. Right. And you were with the 23rd Marines? 23rd Marines. Tell yeah. me, what was it like? And you were working in a battalion aid station. Right, right. Well, when I got wounded, by the way, there was four of us. We were taking stretchers, litters up front, going up to get some wounded. And of course, the Japs were still on Mount Suribachi, and you take four men with four stretchers, we stood out like a sore thumb, and they started throwing uh, mortars at us, and one of them had landed fairly close. One of the corpsmen was hit in both arms and legs. One of them was knocked unconscious. I had my wound, and the other corpsman, nothing happened to him. Uh, I think what else? By the way, the, the night, the first night on shore there, I can remember this, casually, we, about dusk, they closed the beach. There was no more ships coming in. We had no way of taking casualties out. Uh, so we had to do the best we could for them along the shore. Uh, they didn't dare bring any ships in because they'd had to have lights and lights and we just stuck out like a sore thumb and the Japanese would have started firing at them at that time. Now, what were your duties in the battalion aid station? Well, uh, at Evil, my duties, do what the doctor told me. Uh, I have given IVs, intravenous, shots, physicals, uh, in fact, I can remember, by the way, when I was with the 10th tank battalion, we had to go through physicals for everybody, 500 men on it. And we had to draw blood tests. Most of the other fellows didn't like it. Well, my experience in the, in the laboratory there in Charleston, South Carolina, didn't bother me a bit. I, I, I drew probably 450 of the blood tests there that 10 days we were on active duty. Uh, in the service, we get a little more leeway than some and the nurses do it in the hospital sometimes. Uh, first of all, you don't have doctors at every, in every platoon. You don't have nurses at every, every base either. Mm -hmm. So they gave us a little more leeway than what we did sometimes. Well, let's, let's stop here because we're about to run out of this tape. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Three minutes. Yeah, close it down. Take two, interview of Mr. Robert S. Shetler on 30 March 2001. We were talking about Iwo Jima, uh, Battalion Aid Station. Can you give us sort of a picture of what was going on in the aid station? Well, <laughs> that's quite a question. It was pretty hectic because there was a lot of casualties. Uh -huh. and. Uh, we had two medical doctors with us, and then there was a, there was a dentist with us too, by the way. And uh, they would check the fellow to see what had to be done to the casualties they come in. Uh, there was no lack of casualties, believe me. Uh, where the Japanese were located on Mount Suribachi, they could see everything we were doing. Uh, I know from things I've read afterwards about the Navy bombardment and stuff, it didn't affect them very much because they were told so deep. Uh, and I know I've talked with well, different fellows what happened after I even left there, met some of them. And uh, they uh, they were hidden under underground, what they were at. And they'd come out when nobody was looking at dark after dark and so forth. Be, and this would be behind our lines too, they would come out. Uh, we were on the alert all the time, you had to be careful. Uh, if it was dark and you see somebody moving, you wanted to know who they were. And they better speak in good English. Mm -hmm. uh, 
and then I, I it, it was just like probably the emergency room in any hospital, a big hospital where it's busy all the time, uh, making sure that somebody that's bleeding is bleeding and stopped. Uh, if they need some plasma or, or blood, we can get it to them. You see now, in Iwo Jima, the weather wasn't that cold. In Korea, the weather was cold that you couldn't use any plasma, it would freeze. In fact, I was just the other day, I was trying to think what I did, what I did, what I do for water. I don't remember having any water in my canteens up in northern Korea where it was 30 below zero. I know I had these cans of fruit that were slushy-like and ice, that, that's where you got moisture from. I, I think that's all I, I try to remember this and I can't. Mm -hmm. And I remember though, and when the weather got milder, I know that there'd always be a couple of, of men who'd go down and get us water, bring up some buckets of water or some cans of water, or take our canteens down. But in, in uh, Northern Korea, I can't remember that. Well, let's let's continue a bit with Iwo okay. Jima, All right. and then we'll move, okay. move forward. Um, what were you thinking when you were in the aid station? I mean, did you feel like you had been prepared for what you had to deal with? Or was it a shock? Well, <laughs> shock, yes. Uh, thinking, when can I get out of here? <laughs> and how soon? Uh, of course, this was my first real time of combat. Uh, I, I, I wasn't happy to be there, I know that. But also, and, and I can both. Then at Iwo and also in Korea, that when you're so busy, you got things to do, you forget about what's happening. Something uh, you got to concentrate on the job you're doing. So it was like you you weren't even noticing. You must have seen some horrendous wounds. I mean, yes, I yes, I did see some bad ones. Were you thinking about it? Were you treating these people, or just come on? We could to treat them, stop bleeding. Um, I remember one fellow real bad that you couldn't tell he was a man. Knew he wasn't a woman because they weren't in combat then. But he lost all of his private parts. In fact, he died shortly after he got into the aid station. He lost so much blood. Uh, what do you do in a situation like that? Give him some morphine to put him out of his pain. And, and what must you be thinking when you're, you're you're doing something like this here? I'm, I'm trying to th think. Even if I did think anything about it, I, you you try to put it out of your mind, I guess. Uh, I can tell you. Yeah. Just how do you go through something like that? I mean, how do you keep going? The natural reaction would be to just like turn away and, and be horrified. Well, you have to keep going. Uh, I didn't have too much experience with people that had mental problems. Mm -hmm. I know that all the services did from Vietnam, and I have run across veterans from Vietnam in the VA, in the VA hospital there in Syracuse. Uh, I don't remember, I know not in Iwo, in Korea, anybody having a problem with drugs. Well, we just weren't any place where we could get them, I think, maybe. That was, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I know that I had morphine most of the time with me. And I just, sometimes I had these small bottles of medical brandy. Uh, I don't know as I ever, I don't remember ever taking, drinking any of that brandy. Maybe I did. Maybe this is what settled my nerves. <laughs> but I, I, I really can't remember on this. It was, somebody was telling you what to do, you were doing it. And, and every once in a while, you ducked because you heard incoming mail, you heard something hit close by. Uh, I know that uh, I don't remember ever crawling in one of these holes that mortars had made, because I know fellows that went into them, some of them got hit afterwards, too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you were safer just laying out on the beach. There wasn't really much of a place to hide on I mean, you. No, there was no place to hide. And 
I have, uh, it was given to me at an EO reunion head in Syracuse here, a little bottle about yay big of black sand. It's supposed to be sand of Iwo Jima. And uh, you walking around in that sand, you'd sink in almost to your knees. Well, you know how hard it is to walk around in snow that deep? Well, this is a problem too in that sand. Uh, in fact, uh, I noticed that, I noticed it, like if they, they brought jeeps in, they were going to use them for ambulances. Jeep was no good in that stuff. And they did lay down some tracks so that vehicles could drive on the tracks. And a, and a track field like a tank or something like that could, could maneuver through some of the well, that brings up a good point. Now, you would go forward on, on litter parties and pick people up, bring them back to the aid station. Right. <coughs> How did you carry somebody who was wounded in, in, in that kind of sand? As careful as you could, which wasn't too careful sometimes. Uh, if they were real bad, they'd probably been given some morphine already at the front. What I call the front, the front was from here to that wall down there, probably. But. Uh, they were given morphine, and, and if they were in bad pain, we might we'd give them some more too. But it just must have been very physically difficult to carry anybody. It, was, it was. It was very difficult. Okay. On the open ground, concrete. If you're carrying somebody in the stretcher, it's hard to do. You can imagine what it'd be like in, in, in the sand. And, and how did you feel as a, as, a, as a medic? Did you, you know, the inf combat infantryman, he's, he's got to be up front. He's got to you know, do what he has to do. But as a corpsman, uh, did you, you feel like you had to expose yourself to any danger? Or? Well, it's funny you ask this question in a way, because I, in looking back and what happened at different times, both World War II and Korea, so many times when the fighting is going on, you have nothing to do. Just sit and think and wonder what's going to happen. But when you hear that call, Corman, then you've got to go. And I know I've had other Marines tell me that, that when they used to call the Corman, they'd say, this guy's got to get out. He's going to be a target now. Uh, Did you think about that? I mean, all the rest of the Marines are all hunkered down under fire. And the call goes up for corpsmen. You that was your job. Yeah. Did you feel a particular bond with the other with the Marines you were working with? Got along good with the Marines. Uh, there was a little rivalry also, you know. Uh, of course, I was a swab jockey. I was a bedpan jockey. And I had a few names for them too, you know, uh, jarheads and leathernecks and you name it. Um, the captain that we had over there in Korea, he finally became a, a assistant commandant. And I called him, I talked to him on the phone a couple of years ago. I don't even know if he's still alive. I tried to get a hold of my camp. But he asked me the same, how'd you get along with the Marines? I said, fine, uh, Skipper. I said, uh, 40 jarheads and one squabby. Not even odds. <laughs> and I'm, he's still sputtering. <laughs> Four stars he made. I've got a little note from him. I sent him a, a roster that I had in a little notebook. And he sent me back a thank you. And at the top of the station, there's four red stars on it. There. Well, let's move ahead to okay. after the war. Okay. Well, you were in active reserve. In active reserve. And then you went active reserve. Right. Why did you go active reserve? Well, we had, my wife and I, we had a boy, year old. I was making the fantastic sum of $65 a week. I think she was making about 40 when she was working, and her mother, after we, the boy boys born, her mother helped take care of our, our son. Uh, the Marine Reserves, they drilled one Sunday a month, but they got paid for two days' pay. All day it was. Hey, hey that was good money to back in those days. Uh, I forget what it was we got paid then. We have very little information on the 10th Tank Battalion in that period. Right. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what your drills were like? You know, what would you do on a Sunday? Well, the, the corpsmen would go out there and uh, 
we run physicals, what we would do, and give shots. And it was continuous. And in fact, when we were activated, we had to go through the whole thing again. All the, everybody had physicals again. Uh, our commanding officer was a major case. And I'm trying to think who the second command, I can't think of his name right now, but uh, they were, there was the old, the old airport had these old hangars, and that's where we used to, we used to do our inside, we had place inside to go. Uh, there was a couple of different companies, and I have, I have some pictures at home, by the way, that were taken at a reunion, and also taken, well, one picture was taken in, in Japan of some of the fellows and he helped it. I just got that recently. I'm planning on, I'm talking with some of the Marines that were, in the, were planning on a reunion. We were in the midst of doing it and I says, I can't do much on it until after I get back from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been together once I can, that I can remember and that was right after we come out. Uh, the 10th tank, they, I don't remember them having any tanks there. I don't think they ever got them, on the, and maybe they might have. I don't remember them. Don't remember any, any tanks no. in the old airport. See, they were just forming these outfits at that time. Uh, I don't remember any of them. Now, I've been out here to the tank battalion. In fact, they had me out about a month ago and I gave a talk to the Marines. There was one Navy corpsman that sat in on that too, by the way. And uh, I got a kick out of it. I started out with a talk by saying, you know, the last time I talked with a, to a company of Marines, it was on uh, uh, certain health things that you fellows should know about, because I'm not going to talk about it today. <laughs> but uh, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, no, I, 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 I can't complain. You know, sir, any time I got my have to come back to the States, if I walked into a bar with my Marine uniform on and my Navy insignia, mm -hmm. some Marine would yell out, give Doc a drink. Oops, yeah. hit my back there. <laughs> well, let's see, I'm trying to get a, a, a better mental image picture here. So, on a typical Sunday, you would go to one of these old hangars. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, would you be wearing your navy blues or would you be wearing... No, no, I had I had uh, marine khakis. This was oh. summertime, we, we weren't wearing khakis. I don't think they wear the full khakis anymore, by the way. Because when I was out in California, the Marines were wearing khaki shirts and green trousers. Right. I think they've changed their regulations. Yeah, they did. Uh, I have a picture taken, me, my wife, and my oldest son, that has me in that in those khakis. Probably about the same time that we were activated. And uh, so you'd go to the hangar, and you would uh, do physicals and right. any kind of training. I don't recall too much training, as such. Uh, of course. We were all working together. We were in training as far as, see, we didn't, we didn't go along with the Marines. I didn't at the time. I was working inside in the, like the dispensary there. Mm -hmm. Some of the, I know the companies, I think they probably had a Marine corpsman with them if they went out on a problem. I don't, I don't recall that. Okay. And this is before they got the reserve center and the land. The thing yes, about. yes. See, they, uh, they deactivated that the month after we were activated to call into active duty. And then they, it was after that they came out here. Did you ever go to any summer camps with them? No, because I wasn't with them that long enough. Uh -huh. yeah. And you got separated from the 10th Tank Division, uh, tank, tank Battalion at Camp Pendleton. Yeah, we, when we got to Camp Pendleton, usually no matter where you are, if you're a hospital corpsman, you're separated from when you're transferred. Now, I wouldn't report in to the officer of the day, the Marines, I would report in to the sick bay or the medical section. Mm -hmm. And they would assign me duties there. Like when I came back from, leave from Korea, I uh, went back to Treasure Island. 
and I was at Treasure Marine Barracks, but I was assigned duty at at the sick bay there, help out with sick call, things of that nature. We didn't have much sick call at the tank battalion. Uh, yes, I, I know that there, we had a doctor there, and I, I guess probably we did. Somebody was sick at that on that date. Where, where did most of the uh, members of the tank battalion come from? Central New York. They were there from Fulton, Oswego, Auburn, Cortland. Were they Oswego. were they mainly veterans or were they new kids? Or? Quite a few were veterans, but there were some new kids too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, did I mention it? When we were in Japan, some of these fellows had never fired a rifle before. And I remember going out on the rifle range there, and that was the first time they ever shot a, a, a carbine or an M1. Now, do you know what became of the 10th Tank Battalion? Did they go to Korea? Not as a tank battalion. They were split up when they got to California. Uh, some of them went to Amtrak's, some of them went to tanks, some of them went to infantry. There was all different directions. From what I was reading recently, <coughs> no one knows. I didn't realize it, that some of our fellows from the 10th tank went, went on the Inchon landing. They must have sent them air, air mail over to Korea. Um, I, I heard that just recently, and I, I didn't believe it at first. I said, well, we were, we were activated uh, August, and probably some of these fellows were, they were, had been in before, they were called up right away, I think is what happened. And, and so basically, they used them as personnel replacements. Yes, yes. Well, you see, when the now when the Marine Division landed in China, it wasn't a division; it was a brigade. Mm -hmm. When MacArthur asked for them, they were a brigade, mm -hmm. and they didn't become a division. My, in fact, my first mail that I got <coughs> sent my wife. My return address was First Marine Brigade. Mm -hmm. But after we got to Japan and a change of division, they they built it up enough. Do you ever you, you keep up with guys from the 10th, Mount, uh, 10th Tank Division? Uh, a few of them, yes. Uh, as I say, this next week I'm going to Jacksonville, North Carolina. It's a reunion of Easy Company 2nd Battalion 5th Marines that were in Korea. Uh, I went to one reunion about a year and a half ago in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. They had a reunion last year in St. Louis, but I, I didn't go to that reunion. A fellow that I went to Harrisburg with, he went to it. No, he's not going to this one. In fact, this fellow, he was a Marine. And we went to Harrisburg together, and he said, he said me, Doc, something's bothering me. I said, what? He says, one of my legs. So we got to the hotel, he says, feel my leg. Well, one leg was warm and one leg was cold. I said, you better see a doctor as soon as you get back to Syracuse. Well, he wound up amputating that leg after he got back. And I, he won't go this time. He's on an oxygen tank down to him. But we're all getting older. Uh, yes, I, I'm very active with the Korean War Vets of Central New York. In fact, I'm the adjutant, which is a fancy name for secretary. Uh, I belong, you name the reserve outfit I belong to, or rather the veterans outfit. I'm a life member of the VFW, a life member of the Military of the Purple Heart, a life member of the Stable American Veterans, member of the American Legion and a few other, 1st Marine Division Association. I belong to them all, I don't know why. <laughs> Let's jump ahead to uh, uh, Chosan Reservoir. Mm -hmm. uh, it was after, it was just about Thanksgiving that the Chinese hit you. Thanksgiving Day, uh, I think Thanksgiving was the 24th of November that year, I try to recall. We were set up on the east side of the Chosen Reservoir, the 5th Marines were. In fact, Thanksgiving Day, half of the outfit went down to a mess hall that was set up, and we had turkey, a dressing, and you name it. We had a Thanksgiving dinner. We went back up and relieved them, and they, the other half went back down there. Uh, it was the following Monday that we were relieved by an, a Marine, an Army outfit, and then we passed through the 7th Marines going into the village of Udamni. And yes, it was starting start to really get cold then. In fact, when we first went up to the reservoir, we didn't have these shoe packs. We had the old boondockers. Mm -hmm. 
from World War II, I think they were from, and they weren't the warmest thing, I'll tell you. The, the uh, shoe packs we got, at least they were a little warmer, but then your feet sweat so much. And like I said, you take the shoe packs off and the socks would come off frozen inside of them. Well, that's been enormously cold up there. It was cold. And, and I, I understand there that at that time, it did get down to close to 50 below zero, but during the daytime, 20 and 30 below. And you had problems with like plasma? And you couldn't use it because it would freeze up. Anything liquid would, would freeze. You ever do anything like put the plasma inside of your uh, field jacket to keep it warm? Mm -hmm. Well, there wasn't room enough in there to put it. <laughs> and no, and, and of course, we wouldn't, where I was with the, with the platoon I was with, we didn't use plasma. It would be back at the aid station and so forth, and where they had, might have a tent set up where they could warm it. Uh, I agree, I know that uh, at times we have, we, when it was so cold, we did put a tube of, of uh, morphine in our mouth, hold it in our cheek, that would keep the thought out, or inside, my inside pocket. Uh, and uh, like I said, inside my shirt, I carried rations to try to thaw them out, mm -hmm. and socks. Socks got pretty ripe after wearing them for about a month after changing them on back and forth, but I was stunk just as bad as everybody else alongside of me, so it, you didn't notice it. So, what was it like in late November, uh, you know, in a defensive position around Chosun Reservoir? I mean, at night you'd, you'd be in your foxhole. Well, at that time, when we were first set up there, we didn't know about the Chinese. We had shelter apps set up. And I know that uh, generally the, we, the shelter apps half the tent, see, so the two of us worked together and put shelter apps <coughs> up. Uh, and we did have sleeping bags. I remember along the way coming out of the Chosen Reservoir, we had a chance to stop. I would put my feet inside the sleeping bag up to my waist. I never got in any deeper than that because you might have to get out in a hurry. Uh, there were fellows that didn't get out in time that were killed in their sleeping bags. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to think. But as, as far as set up, we didn't know the Chinese were there. And in, in fact, I, stuff that I've read since then, so many intelligent officers had known about this, they were reporting it, they were, they were picking up Chinese prisoners, but I, I don't remember ever being sent down to the line as far as I know. How did things change after the Chinese were involved? Well, of course, we were in combat com continuously then. We were supposedly completely surrounded. When we were sent up on the hill there that morning of the 28th, told to bring up rear guard to watch the division out, I can remember you know, at the time saying, what are you doing here? If you went through too much of this five, six years ago, what are you doing here? You know. And, and then I thought, bringing up rear guard's going to be the worst worst place to be. But you know, the fighting was in front of us all the time. The guys in the point were doing the fighting. We were bringing up rear guard. Why the Chinese didn't attack little sections of the rear, I don't know. They they goofed. They had to do that. Uh, after we, when we left the village of Udan, no, of Hagaruri, we weren't rear guard anymore. We were sort of in between. Uh, the 1st Marine Regiment had fought their way up the pass, and I think probably the 7th fell in behind us then. And I'm trying to recall, and I, I think this is what happened. Um, you all almost didn't make it out. There was one point where the Chinese had blown the bridge. Right. Right. We heard the bridge had been blown, and uh, there was discussion of whether they were going to go up over the high ground or what they were going to do. Then they dropped those sections of the bridge. That must have been quite an engineering feat to drop those bridges where they needed them and not down in the over the pass. I think they did one of one of the spans did get lost as I recall. So it did, and then the remaining spans weren't enough to quite get over the gap. Now, yeah, right, right. there was an officer who was able to figure out. Wayne uh, Park. You know, that, uh, I can remember walking across that bridge. <laughs> yeah, what the, uh, the Army Engineer Officer had to do was 
um, actually build a wooden ramp right. large enough to uh, connect it because of the, the three spans that were left. You know what, I'm glad I wasn't one of the fellows driving those trucks or the tanks going over that because they had to be in just a certain spot. And then you finally made it down to Wonsan. No, not Wonsan, down to Hamhung. Yeah, Wonsan. That's right. That's right. Sorry. You see, uh, we didn't walk all the way down. We got down to the foot of the pass. There was a railhead. They put us on cattle cars. And then we took us. they took us over to the, the seaport. I can never remember which is Hamhung or Hung Nam. One is one and one's the Hamhung, other. I think. Yeah. What about, you now? later on you were back in the line when the Chinese first counteroffensive took place? Yeah, see, we went from Hamhung down to Pusan, where they regrouped. Right. And then we moved north again. And, well, just about 50 years ago this time, Thanksgiving Day would be the same exact day as this year. It's 50, 1951. I remember going out on a, a, a maneuver we went out on, uh, raining, like today, and coming back to that shelter half soaking wet. I had a can of uh, heat, you know, <coughs> and I lit that and put a can of rations on there to warm it up. Crawled inside my sleeping bag, so I'm soaking wet just to dry, warm up a little bit. So, what was that like when the Chinese attacked again? Well, this was, of course, we weren't set up like they were on all sides of us. They were, there was a line and they were in front of us. And I'm trying to tell you what, what what it was like different. It was with combat. I can remember firing going on back and forth and everything. Uh, they didn't overrun us at that time. I know we were we were lucky. <coughs> well, we're coming down towards the end of the tape. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when you look back on it all, both World War II and Korea, your time in the service, is there something in particular that stands out in your memory? Something in particular. Well, I think one of the things that really stands out is that day that I was set up on top of the hill there at you damn me and said, what am I doing here, you know? Uh, but I, I, I look back and I say three times overseas, I've got two sons that never had to go in the service, and I'm sort of thankful for that. Um, I don't know what else to say. You think there's a connection because you went, they didn't have to? I don't think there's any connection. They were just at the right age they were. <coughs> the oldest one, he was in college at the time of Vietnam, and the youngest one in Vietnam was over with. Do you have any feelings at the time uh, that Korea was like the forgotten war? I don't think we ever referred to it as that. Uh, I know we wondered why we were there. Uh, I, I, I don't think and things were explained to us like they had been since then. But I look back and I say, Korea, we said, this is it. So we stop here. That's it. No more. And I'm glad we did that. In terms of the communists? Yes. Right. So in retrospect, you feel it was important for us to I think, think it was very important. And by the way, you might be interested in this, that of course our Korean War vets, we have attended church service at the Korean Presbyterian Church several mm -hmm. years ago. Where I attend church, where my wife and I were married, where I attend occasionally now on the Doggy Hill Methodist Church, they have a Korean pastor. And the, and the service is at 9.30 in English, and 11 o'clock they have services in Korean. I have a Korean group that attends church there too. And I have a niece who adopted three Korean girls. Interesting how things all come together. Right. Um, I know you've talked to school groups about your experiences. Right. Anything that we haven't covered that uh, you might want to talk about because someday school children will probably be viewing this. Oh boy, I can't, I can't think of anything you haven't covered. Any final thoughts? 
Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I'm glad that I could do what I did. That's about it. Thank you.